How you doing, Freedom Church? Wow, man, you guys are stoked and excited and highly caffeinated. All right, so glad you are here today. Thank you for coming out to Freedom Church. Before we dive in to this week, kicking off this brand new series called I'm Done, I want to share something with you to put in your calendar. I think it's three weeks from today, uh, we're going to be having our FC Fall Festival, and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be here after this service, going to be from 1 to 4 p.m. I want you to come. I want you, even if you're brand new here, I want you to come, bring your friends, your family. It's going to be an amazing time. We're going to be having a smoker out here with some making barbecue, doing some cool things like that with food. There's going to be bounce houses. There's even going to be a pumpkin chunking contest. How many of you ever seen them do the pumpkin chunking? Raise your hand. All right, this is going to be really cool. This is going to be a good time. We're going to have a good time for adults, the kids, and everybody there. So I want to ask you to put that in your calendar, put it in your iCal, plan to be here. The only thing you need to bring is your chairs, all right? Other than that, I hope to see you there. Bring your friends and family to be a part of that. Today, we're starting a brand new series called I'm Done. Say, I'm Done. When you think about being done, I, if you're like me, I think all of us at one point in time in our lives have said, you know what? I'm over this. I quit. I'm throwing in the towel. I'm done. How many of you ever done that? I have. Raise your hand. Yes. Yes. I think we've all done that at some point in time in our lives when it comes to relationships or when it comes to a marriage or when it comes to your career, when it comes to something to do with your kids. The list goes on and on. But today, I want you to think about a fresh start from God's perspective whenever you say, I'm done with making excuses. We'll talk about that today. I'm done with complaining. I'm done living in fear. I'm done with anxiety. The list goes on and on. Over the coming weeks, I really believe that it's going to be life-changing for a lot of people if you will be a part of this series starting today. And so with that being said, as we talk about excuses, let's think about an excuse for a minute when we all make excuses. You look at the word excuse. Excuse means it's an attempt to lessen the blame where we attach a fault or an offense to it. Basically, we seek to defend or to justify something. That is an excuse. And here's what I want to say to you. Right now is the greatest moment in your life. You say, what do you mean? If you will apply what we learned today from God's perspective, you will never forget this day, September 9th, year 2018. You will never forget it. However, say however, however, there are those of you here that you may not reap what God wants to do in your life because you will make excuses basically to say that I'm not going to listen to this. I'm not going to do what God says. My prayer is that you will learn from this. So let me say this to you. How many of you here often give excuses? I'd say everybody needs to raise their hand, all right? Because I think we're all guilty of that. Well, that being said, there's a lot of lame excuses that people give. No doubt you have given lame excuses before for being late to work. There are many of those. There's all kinds of areas of life that where we give lame excuses. You have a lame excuse a lot of times if you're not careful with your kids' behavior because you lack discipline them. Maybe you're the one at the restaurant and you want to climb under the table so no one will know that it's your kids acting out, right? How many of you been there, done that, got the trophy, <laughs> right? Uh, I have. Uh, you know, a lot of times, even with discipline, sometimes we wonder if it's going to work, but we wonder how well am I doing in this area of life, even raising my kids. Sometimes we look and we say, well, my marriage is not doing so well. Well, what are you doing in your marriage to make it well? Have you done everything that you can do? You know, are you just going to walk out in your marriage or are you going to let God walk in and help your marriage? You think about when it comes to your health. <laughs> you think your health is failing you, your blood pressure is high, but every time in a grocery store you walk by the Twinkies, you walk by them and say, ooh, let me get the Twinkies, you know? You know, or maybe it's a situation where your job isn't going so well, but if you really look at your track record, you've been being late to the job. You haven't been putting in the overtime you need to. You haven't been going the extra mile to see your job go well so you could get the promotion, so you could get the raise. The best lame excuse, and I looked at all these excuses this week, just studying about this. I found the best lame excuse that could ever be given uh, of all time. An elderly man bought a sports car. It was his dream car. So he goes out and gets on this particular highway so that he could drive it. 
Well, next thing you know, he lays into it a little bit. And next thing you know, the guy's doing 120 miles an hour. Lo and behold, he looks behind him and what does he see? Blue lights. And he thinks to himself, I think I can ease away from him. So he lays down on it a little bit more with a lot of pedal left. He gets up to 150 miles an hour. Then all of a sudden he comes to himself and says, I'm too old for this kind of nonsense. He decides to pull over. The police officer gets out of his car, got his gun back here like this, puts his hat on, he walks up and he says, sir, he said, my shift ends in 10 minutes. If you can give me a good enough excuse that I've never heard before in 30 years of law enforcement, he said, I'm going to let you go. The old man says, years ago, my wife ran off with a policeman and I thought it was you bringing her back. (laughs) He said, have a good day, sir. He went to his car and he left. Wow. Wow. Let me tell you what I truly believe that excuses are. Excuses are lies from Satan to make you a failure. I know sometimes excuses, and uh, but probably not 100% of them, but I'll tell you what, the lion's share of them are lies from your enemy to make you a failure. Excuses are just those little white lies that the enemy uses to be able to blindfold us and keep us in mediocrity, not to excel in the life that God has given us to live. And when you decide to change, the enemy just simply wants you to stay the same. That's what the enemy wants to do in your life. See, 99% of failures come from people who have a habit of making excuses. I believe that with all my heart. People, get some of this, People are slow to admit anything, and they're quick to justify everything. So today, I want to be able to share this verse with you, which is a very notable verse. If you've uh, looked at the Bible very much, it is so true. John 10 and 10, check out what it says. It says, the thief, talking about the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him, the devil, said, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So there's two purposes. The enemy wants to steal and kill and destroy your life, my life. Jesus wants to give you and me his purpose of a rich and satisfying life. So let me ask you this, and I want you to resonate with the Spirit, and I want you to think upon this right now. What do you hope in this very present moment that you would want to be different about your life? In this present moment, you look at your life, what is it that you would want to be different about your life in this present moment? We're going to visit that a little bit later, but today I would like, I would just like for you to think, what is it that I would like to be different about my life? Because everybody, I believe if you search your heart and your soul, there will be something different. One thing we've got to do is get away from the excuses, 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 happens quite frequently and it's come to be human nature but not God's nature today as you look we're going to look at one particular story here in Luke's gospel in the New Testament Luke chapter 14 listen to these excuses that Jesus talked about beginning with verse 16 it says a man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations when the banquet was ready he sent his servant to tell the guests come the banquet is ready but they all began making making one said i just bought a field and must inspect it please excuse me another said i have just bought five pairs of oxen and i want to try them out please excuse me another said i just got married dum dum da dum so i can't come here's something i want you to understand about this setting there was a previous invitation that had went out that they agreed that they were coming to the banquet This is the second invitation of when the banquet was ready and they were, the servant went out to tell them that it was ready. So when you look at these three, he says, this first one says here that, that they, that he had bought a field and must inspect it in this current time. And even in today's culture, even in Israel, whenever you're going to buy a piece of property in the Jewish culture, it is a very logistical process. It is layers and layers and layers for it to happen. This guy had already inspected it. This was a lame lie that he was saying. 
that he needed to inspect the property. He had done inspected it multiple times because that's kind of how that goes in the Jewish culture. The second guy here, he says that he wants to try out his pairs of oxen. First and foremost, you don't buy oxen unless you, in, in, in say you're going to try it out later. You don't buy a car, then go drive it. You drive the car, then you buy the car, right? But this third guy, so he's making excuses. The third guy says here, and I quote, another guy said, I just got married and, I ju- and I, so I can't come. I don't know if he's thinking about pound chicka pow now, but he may have been, okay? Don't know. But here's what I will tell you. He was probably wanting to make his wife happy. And the greatest marriage counseling that I can give you, gentlemen, is happy wife, happy life. Always remember that, guys. Always remember that. So when you look at these excuses that they made here, they were lame excuse after lame excuse, much like excuses that we can find ourselves giving. When you look at your life and you maybe thought about what I was challenging you about earlier, about what you would like to be different in your life, But maybe you think, man, you don't understand. I've tried over and over and over again, and nothing is really different. So why should I just even bother trying to do it anymore? Sometimes if you're not careful, the enemy begins to mess with you and say, you're just not really good enough to do this. And it begins to embed in your heart and mind. And if you're not careful, you'll begin to believe it. And then you begin to think, well, I would like to do this, but really I'm better than a lot of people are. You just don't understand. Here's what I believe about a lot of people. Many people have good intentions rather than God intentions. There's a big difference. You say, what do you mean? See, good intentions center around us, but yet we want things to be different. So good intentions are me-centered. That's what they are. But when you look at God intentions, God intentions are very different because God intentions are centered around God. Good intentions are based on my abilities, on my strength, and on my aptitude. Understand that God intentions is where that you and I come to a place in our lives that we want things to be different, so we rely on God's power to do what God wants me to do in my life. If you want a radical change, maybe it's time that you think that you're going to excuse the excuses from this point forward in your life. And it begins with you and me asking the right questions. You say, well, what would that be? Well, what does God want me, want to be different about your life? Have you ever really thought in that measure, what does God want to be different about your life? Think about what does God who made you, loves you and has big dreams and a purpose and a plan for you, What does he want to be different about your life at this moment in your life? Maybe you're here and you're thinking, I really believe God wants me to invest in my children spiritually. See, when it comes to Sundays, maybe it's always an excuse. We're not going to go to church. Or maybe when it comes to the spiritual things, when's the last time you actually sat down and read the Bible to your children? Or if ever. See, when it comes to your kids' lives, and it's something I shared last service, I want to share with this one. I raised three daughters. My wife did the most part of it, but I tried to help the best I could. She was amazing. But man, that season, it went by just like that. Man, I practically begged my girls not to get married as quick as they did. I mean, they all got married at 18 and 19 years old. I even tried to almost pay them to stay at home a little longer. But boy, when them long, lanky, hair leg boys show up, them girls just go bonkers. It's crazy. Thank God I got great son-in-laws. But my point is, is that that season that if you still have your children at home, it is a precious season. And you better utilize every moment, every minute, and every second to invest in their life because here's the truth you'll either invest in them spiritually and help them to become what God created them to be or the world's going to make them and mold them into what the enemy wants them to be to steal and kill and destroy them it's your choice when you look at your life maybe you're thinking in your life you know hey I want to be a good mom and I want to be a good dad how about being a God mom and a God dad but in your life are you truly Think of the spiritual things and what you can do to invest in your kids spiritually. Maybe God's letting you know that you need a church family. And maybe this is the first time you've been in a while. Man, it's so important when you think about a church family. My kids never once walked up to me the entire time that they were in my home and said, Dad, on a Sunday, said, Dad, are we going to church? No, they knew that's where we were going to be. They knew that there weren't going to be an excuse that we're not going. Yes, there's times that you're sick. Yes, I know there's times you're out of town or some of you might have to work. I'm not talking about those things. 
or you're out of town on vacation. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about on a regular basis because it's so important to build that spiritual foundation that you don't one day live in regret because they have nothing to do with God. I seen this article this week and a study was done and it was done by a secular organization and what it was about was a study done of the benefits of going to church. Now grab this I, and I quote, this is what it said. One of the most striking scientific discoveries about religion in recent years is that going to church weekly is good for you. Religious attendance, at least religiosity, boosts the immune system and decreases blood pressure. It may add as much as two to three years to your life. This last sentence got me. The reason for this is not entirely clear. <laughs> Duh. Hello. <laughs> when, when you seek God first in the things you won't will seek you when you seek God first. Maybe it's time that you realize that you read the Bible. Read the Bible. It's funny to me, I can talk to guys and we can talk about football, we can talk about baseball and things like that. And they can tell me, oh man, you remember so and so 20 years ago was on that, on, and he was in the World Series and he hit these many home, blah, blah, blah. But you ask him about a scripture, what's the favorite scripture you read this week? Silence. 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 Man, maybe the Word of God is something you need to get into your life. Listen, when you get the Word of God in you, see, sin will keep you from the Word, but the Word will keep you from sin, see? So important. A quiet time to prepare. You don't know, and I don't know, when we go out into the world in a given day, what's going to happen to us. Man, when you have that power in a private heart and change your life and your relationship with God, then he prepares you to face anything that's out there in the world. How many of you have trouble with someone you work with and they just rub you raw sometimes? How many of you like that sometimes? Man, I mean, it just kind of helps you get along with those people. Or you're going to end up choking them in the name of Jesus, right? You know? You just don't know what's going to happen in a given day. Just don't know. When you think about in your life when it comes to spending time with your spouse, See, if you're not careful, guys, your marriage will fall apart because the things you did at first to win them, you don't keep doing to keep them. Ladies, you know, when you first got married, maybe it's a situation, when you first got married, you try to, to be real sexy for your husband and try to keep him enticed, but next thing you know, it wears off, and ladies, some of you would not want to show publicly the gown you wear to bed now. It just would not be too sexy. As a matter of fact, it would not be something that grandma wears, and you're probably in your 30s. You know, think about that. Ladies, what you did to be able to woo him, you continue to do to keep wooing him, right? What you do to keep his attention and his eyes on you instead of on somebody else. The list goes on and on. When it comes with, with you being a, a person aware that you want to be able to spend time with your kids, maybe instead of tea time on Saturday, it's kid time on Saturday. Think about it. You work all the time, you do everything you can do to be able to work with your career, but your kids wonder, where's dad at? Where's mom at? And I know there's times you have to work over, but I want you to think about it. Just prayerfully consider for this current moment, what does God, want, what is he saying to me about what is he wants me to have? See, sometimes what God wants you to have and what he's speaking to you in your heart is the same thing God may want for you, but it totally changes the approach about it because you think for a moment, what does God want? Maybe a career change. Maybe God is wanting you to change careers because you already know something unethical is going on with that company. And you really know that you don't want to be a part of it. And God is wanting you to change careers. Maybe you need to work on that marriage. Instead of walking out of the marriage, walk back in the marriage and say, I want to work this thing out and I'm going to do everything I can. What do you believe that God wants to be different about your life? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your outline. I want you to write it down right now. Take a pen. If you don't have a pen, it's in the back of your seat. I want to see everybody writing down here something because I believe, and just like I looked at my life this week and I've written it down, hey, you can look at your life and you can write it down. Now, don't be looking at your neighbor's paper right now of what you're writing down and look over and say, ooh, you're weird, dude. Don't be doing that. And let me say, some of you may be sitting beside somebody right now and they're just sitting there staring at me and looking whatever. You might look at them and say, wow, I didn't know I was sitting beside Jesus Christ, the perfect son of God. There's nothing wrong in your life, is it? If there's something that doesn't need to be different in your life, we need to check your pulse because you've checked out. Because everybody has something that God wants to be different in our lives. 
It is so, so true. So when you think about the what that God wants to be different about your life, you have to think about the why. Why does God want this part of your life to be different? See, when you connect the spiritual why with the what, there's a power and there's a motivation to accomplish the what when you understand the why. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, I want to get in better shape. Well, why do you want to get in better shape? You might tell me, well, so I can look better in my clothes when I walk around and I look good. No, no, no. That's not the true why. The true why is if you are out of shape or your health is failing, you want to get better because this is the temple of the Holy Spirit and God has given you this vessel to serve him and love him and give him honor and glory by the life that you live. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, well, you know, I've been thinking about getting in the connection group. Why? Why are you thinking about getting in the connection group? Well, I'd like to have some friends and I'd like to be around some believers and I'd like to be able to read his word with each other. Or maybe you're thinking, I would like to start praying with my wife because we never pray together or I pray him with my kids. Why do you want to do that? Well, you're thinking, well, I want to be a good example for them. All of those things, whether you're getting in a connection group or you want to pray with your wife, get, those are all good things. But let me tell you the true why behind that. The true why is that when you want to become better, you want to become like Christ. When it comes to your family, you want to lead your family to become like Christ. That is the true why behind that. So when you connect the spiritual why with the what, your motivation all of a sudden begins to increase to do what God wants you to do, and that pleases God. Ultimately, in all of our lives, no matter what it is, when you agree with God that this should be different, there's no excuse on earth to keep that from happening in any way, shape, form, or fashion. When God is for you, who can be against you? Nobody, not the enemy or anybody. Even the Satan, when he tries to come against you, you and God, you might feel like that you're the minority, but you and God are the majority. When his power is available to you, there's absolutely no excuse that's going to keep you from God's perfect will. You say, well, why is that? Because when it isn't a me-centered thing and it's a God-centered thing, that's when it's going to be accomplished. This is what God wants me to do, and there's no force upon this earth that will keep me from God's perfect will. And when you live this kind of life, I promise you, God's going to end up getting the glory from your life and to be able to do the things that you couldn't do on your own because you look to him to help you accomplish it. So here's where we're going. No more excuses. Would you just simply say that with me? No more excuses. Say it again. No more excuses. When you look at the life of Moses, here he was, a guy that started out in life as a basket case. He literally was floating in a basket. His family was scared he was going to be taken out because they wanted to kill all the Hebrew slave boys. And Pharaoh's daughter finds him, raises him up in the palace. Next thing you know, when he grows up in the favor of the grandest uh, kind of country it was at that time and the world power of that time, he figures out he's a Hebrew and he sees the oppression of his people. And next thing you know, he murders a slave task, a slave master, I mean, one of the taskmasters for the slaves. And next thing you know, he's excommunicated and all this stuff happens and he's gone and finds himself there. And, being out in the wilderness there at Mount Sinai, and he goes up on the mountain. He had found a wife and Jethro's family and married and all that kind of stuff. And next thing you know, he's on the mountain, and an angel Lord is lit, and he's basically got a bush burning. He can't figure out why the bush is not burning up. So he tries to approach it, and God spoke to him. He said, Moses, take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. So he begins to have a conversation with God here, and God lets him know, I have heard the cries of my people in bondage in Egypt. And I want to use you, Moses, to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. But what does Moses do? He begins to use the conjunction of but and lets his but get in the way of what God wanted him to do. A lot of times, like many of us, we let our but get in the way. So as he's having this conversation and dialogue back and forth, we pick up in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Basically he's saying, I don't like public speaking, God. 
I tried to join in the valley of the Toastmasters. They wouldn't even let me in when they heard me say something. I just couldn't say nothing right, but I was just stuttering along. And, you know, I can't get in front of That's what leaders do. They get in front of people. I would appeal myself. God, I can't. I mean, he's making all these kind of excuses of why he can't do it. He's giving excuses to God of why he couldn't do that. What exactly is, was he doing? Moses was doing what you and I do as human beings. He's looking at his own inabilities rather than looking at God's unlimited abilities that we can have in our lives. Look at verse 11. Then the Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether he's, people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. God is saying, if I ask you to do something, Moses, don't you think that I'm going to help you to get it done? And the same for, is for you and me. Don't you think the God of all creation is going to help you and me to get done that what he wants you and me to do in our lives? So today, like God told Moses, I think it's applicable and we make it to our lives you and I are to go and do what we can. That's what he's telling Moses here. I told you what to do, now go. Quit making excuses. Quit whining about it. Quit thinking about it. Quit saying, oh, I'll go and I'll pray about it. You say, well, aren't you belittling in prayer? No. A lot of times when God has already told you what to do, it's not time to pray about it. It's time to go and do it. It's time to quit whining about it. And I tell you what we end up doing. Here's what we end up doing. And when it comes to God, want us to do some things. It's been said that delayed obedience is disobedience. Don't over-spiritualize everything and say, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I'm just waiting on the Lord. You know, I know I need to quit smoking, so I'm just waiting on the Lord to take away the desire. <laughs> yeah. No, let me help you out. If you got a pack of cigarettes in your pocket and you know already God wants you to quit, when you leave, throw them in the bucket back there. We know exactly what to do with them. All right? I'm not saying that smoking is a spiritual thing. It's a health thing. Smoking won't send you to hell. You just smell like you spend a lot of time in hell. When God says go, you go. It's not something you need to pray about. I believe God wants me to be able to do this or do that. I believe God wants me to be a better husband. That means you begin to serve your wife at Christ, served the church, and gave his life for it. What you did at first, you keep doing to keep her. You need to be a better wife. Do the things that you know you need to do as a wife, or whether it's a father, or whether it's a mother. You know you need to attend church. You know what's funny about this church is we don't lock the doors on Sunday morning. We've never closed the doors on this church, but maybe one time in 16 years, and it was a really bad snowstorm, and I sat home with a, just a sinking spirit in my gut. That we actually had to do that. Yes, we want to be safe. Maybe you're saying, well, I know I need to stop drinking. She says I am just seem to be getting upset and things like this. No, listen. Listen to me. It's the difference in drinking and getting drunk. Okay? Drunkard's not going to enter heaven. But let me tell you something. When you start abusing alcohol, you're going to cause problems in your life and the life of the people around you that love you. Our pastor that I have when he married me, he said a thimble full is too much. That's what he said. I've often thought about that. Some people say, well, you don't understand. You know, I know I get angry and I get upset with my family, but you have to understand. My father was like that. My grandfather was like that. That's why it's just who I am. No, 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 no. You can cop out all you want to. That's who you choose to be. When you lose your temper, you choose to lose your temper. So you're making a choice. That's not who you are. Anger doesn't come through DNA the choice that you make the list goes on and on but here's the formula Philippians 4 13 listen to what Paul told the church at Philippi which is very good and applicable for freedom today it says for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength he says for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength so here's what we got to do we got to go and do what we can but this second part is so important you got to trust God to do what you can't and what I can't that's what you've got to do God told Moses, quit whining. I'm going to help you. you got to trust me. Some of you have been thinking for a while. I know God wants me to be in a connection group, but I don't know what to do. You need to go out those doors when this service is over and go to that connection center and say, help me find a group for me. Or pull out that booklet that's in your worship guide, put a number on the back of the connection card in the back of your seat, and when you leave, drop it in the bucket as you leave the service. That group leader will call you. 
If you go to that group and things seem real weird, you just be nice to them and leave and say they were weird. And they might say when you leave and say, I'm glad they left because they were weird. <laughs> because people say, well, church is full of clicks. Yes, it is. People click together at different seasons of life. If I go to a group, I'm clicking with a group, it's empty nesters. Whoop, whoop, whoop. We don't have any women at home anymore. Listen, I raised three daughters, had a wife. Listen, testosterone only doubled up when I had a boy dog, okay? I know what it's like to raise girls. But the point of it is, you've got to put the go in that, and you've got to trust God to do what you can. Go and do that. Maybe you're watching church online. You think, well, I would go, but I just don't know what they'll be like at that church. Go and do what you can. Come to church. Don't be lazy. Come and check us out. Kononia Fellowship. It happens here. Do that. If you're a long ways away from here, find people, invite them to your house and have a home church or find a good Bible-believing church. Don't use the online as an excuse not to trust God to come here because you're scared of what people might be like. I, I don't have any snakes in my hands, so don't worry about that. Let's give some love to all those watching online. I would love to meet you next Sunday here if you're local. Love to do that. Maybe it's a situation where you know you need to do a new career. Maybe you got married very quick. You started having children. You had to jump into a career that was not your choice, not what you wanted to do. But you know God is wanting you to go back to school. You have it in your heart. He's wired you a certain way. Listen, it's going to take sacrifice. Yes, it's going to take discipline. Yes. But man, maybe that's what God wants you to do, to do that what he wired you to do. See, we're all in full-time ministry. We just pull our paychecks from different places. Maybe you've, you've got that resume filled out, but you just haven't sent it to the company yet. Trust God to do what you can't. I'll never forget when I first started dating my wife. I was a wild child. <laughs> my wife wasn't. I prayed for her, and she came my way. I'll never forget the first time I carried her around my wild friends. After I took her home and the next time I was around them, this is what they said. She is not like you, Terrell. I said, really? I need somebody better. No, they wasn't saying that. They were saying, she's too good for you, Terrell. That's what they were saying, and I finally figured that deal out. So that's when I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go and do what I can, and I'm going to trust God to do what I can, and I'm going to get my life right before him, and I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And you know what? Next Sunday, I, with God's help, we proved them wrong, because next Sunday we celebrate 29 years of marriage. That's God. Listen to Jeremiah, the prophet, in chapter 32 and verse 27. I love this. He says, I am the Lord, the God of all the peoples of the world. Is anything too hard for me? See, you know what God wants when he knows he wants something different for you and for me. If you're not careful, you're going to keep giving excuses. You're going to say, I can't. It won't happen. Read this verse, the last sentence. God is saying, is anything too hard for me? If you can say, well, God wants me to have a godly marriage, but you don't live with him. No, no, no. Don't go there. Do what you can do and ask God to help you with that. Well, I know God wants me to be patient with my kids, but if you had my, no, no, no. Ask God to help you to be able to do what only God can do through you. No more earthly excuses discounting the eternal power of Almighty God. Is anything too hard for God? No. No. I think about the major writer of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, which was before Saul. Here he was raised up in the Sanhedrin. He was, his, he was the strictest sect of the Pharisees, the Scripture teaches us. And he was going around putting people of the way, Christians, in prison. And as he was putting them in prison, even to the point of murdering them, he was on his way to Damascus continuing on what he thought was what he was supposed to do. And he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And he got knocked off his high horse. He got blinded in the moment. And there's two great questions that came out of him saying, Lord, Lord kept telling him, you don't need to be kicking against the goad to the preacher. You don't need to be doing against me what I need to do. So what did he do in that moment? He asked two very important questions. He says, who are you, Lord? And what would you have me to do? Those are two of the greatest questions you'll ever ask of God. Who are you, Lord? And what would you have me to do? After that, he goes on. He becomes doing all the great things. People were scared of him, but he ends up proving himself to be for Jesus Christ, people the way. But he had a thorn in his flesh that he began to pray about. 
Matter of fact, it says he prayed three different times. And God did not remove the thorn in the flesh. Some people think it was scholars debate that it was some kind of physical infirmity. But he says this in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10. The response to his prayer, he said, each time he said, referring to God, Paul said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and trouble that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. No more excuses. You go and you do what you can. You trust God to do what you can't. Ultimately, the last thing I'll share with you, God's plan for you will come when your excuses go away. It'll come. Excuses in our lives gives us permission to settle for less than God's best in our lives. I love this verse. Many people have it as a life verse. It's one of my and my wife's favorite verses. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. God is saying enough. He's saying here it's time for you to receive victory that I have for you in your life and the things that I have in store for you that I made in the order to steps of your life before you were ever born. You can do everything through Christ who gives you strength. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to give you supernatural, powerful qualifications to do that in the process. He can cause you to be at the right place at the right time. He can cause you to meet the right people at the right time. He can cause the right situation to happen at the right time. That is God. And if you speak into your life and into your situation, you speak faith into your circumstances, the favor of God and the blessings of heaven will chase you down. And when your excuses begin to go away, because he's a God who has your life in mind when you were born, and he wants you to discover that and chase after that. Listen, when your dreams become bigger than your excuses, that's when God will begin to show up and show out in your life like never before. I promise you, church. I promise you. The grace of God will supply your needs. You don't have to rationalize. You don't have to have a lack of personal victory because God's plans for your life. And you need to begin to speak life into your own life of what God can do in your life. God's plans will give you a new hope and it's going to give you a bright future. It's going to give you a bright future. Stop excusing your dreams away. Grab a hold of them and see what God will do. See what God will do. Let them override the regrets and the rationalization that the enemy begins and continues to speak into your life and say, you know what, I'm not going to listen any longer. My prayer is for you today that you'll say, I'm done making excuses. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm not going to be caught up in good ideas. I'm going to be not going to be caught up in good intentions. I'm going to be a person that's going to seek out God, and I'm going to seek out his ideas and his plans for me, and I'm going to let those become action for what God wants me to do in my life. I want you to repeat after me. I can, I can. do everything, do everything. Through, Christ through Christ who strengthens me. Trust God. After you go, step out in faith. Trust God to do what you can't do. And he'll get the glory because the plans that he had for you begins to come about in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may we all ever stop insulting your holy name with our apathetic excuses. And may you speak to everyone today what you want in every life. Some of you came in these doors ready to throw the towel in. You may have already voiced that, that you're done, whether it was relationally, financially, physically, professionally. But let me say this, if you're living and breathing, you can audibly hear me online or in this auditorium. I will tell you, my friend, God isn't finished with you yet. 
You know God wants something different for your life or for your situation. Something significant needs to change. You know that right now. And if that's true in your life and God has put his finger on it and you've written it down, it's on your heart. Would you lift your hand right now? Very high. Lift your hand and say, I know something needs to change in my life. It's not just what God wants. It's why God wants it. God bless you. Keep those hands up. Raise your hands up all over the auditorium. No one looking around. The only thing person you need to worry about is you. God bless you. God bless you. Hands are up everywhere. Hands are up everywhere. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for these that lifted their hands. Father, I pray, God, that you would give them a burden, Lord, and the faith that they need to be different and to go and to do what they can and trust you, God, to do what they can. God, you have big plans for them when their excuses go away. God, I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that you would encourage them. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would empower them that they can do everything through you who gives them strength. To those of you that lifted your hands and anyone else, and I pray it be all of us, would you just simply tell God where you're at, I'm done making excuses. Make that your prayer. I'm done, God, making excuses. Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. You haven't followed Christ. You say, well, how do I know I'm not a Christian? If you look at your life right now, and nothing resembles the teaching of God in the Bible, but something is drawing you toward God, let me tell you what that is, my friend. That's the work of the Holy Spirit of God who reaches out to people who are not God's and draws them into a relationship with God. Let me tell you who is going to, to give you many excuses of why that you shouldn't give your life to Jesus. It's the enemy, Satan himself, because he can't have what you're being drawn to. Let me tell you what he's going to do. He's going to speak into your life and probably say, oh, this is an emotional thing. Don't listen to him. You say, you just tell him back, no, this is a spiritual thing. <laughs> he's going to speak into your life and you're not good enough for God. You just tell him back, nobody's good enough for God. He's going to tell you, oh, you need to clean up your life first. Say, you know what? I'm going to let God clean up my life first. He's going to tell you, well, what if you try and everybody sees you do this and he, you're going to be a hypocrite? Listen to me, friend. You just tell the enemy, I'm going to try and I'm going to fail and that's life because I'm human. Some of you, you believed in Jesus. You've been in church, and, but you're not fully devoted to Jesus. Guess what? <laughs> Today's going to change. In your mind, you need to say, in, in your mind, say, God, this is going to be different today. I'm seeking you. But the enemy's going to slip in. He's going to say, but people are going to say that they thought I was a Christian. <laughs> you know what I'd tell the enemy? I'd say, you know what? Today, they're going to know that I'm a Christian for sure. doesn't matter what people think. No excuses. Jesus bled. He died. He rose again so you could be forgiven and I could be forgiven and so that we could all have eternal life. No excuse on earth keeping you from knowing him and serving him. I want to do something very bold. It's going to take courage on your part. Right where you're at. Christians, your head's down and praying. Every head bowed because this is between you and God. Those of you that lifted your hand and you know that you're not a Christian, those of you that didn't lift your hand and you know you're not a Christian, or maybe you've been drawn back to God and you were once there, but you haven't been following him, I want to challenge you to stand to your feet right where you're at and say, you know what, no more excuses. I'm not listening to the enemy. I want it all. Just stand up right where you're at. Don't wait. Just stand to your feet. You know that you want to come back to God. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. I see you standing. Remain standing. Anyone else? God bless you. I see you back there. God bless both of you. God bless both of you. Anyone else? God bless you. I see you here, ma'am. Anyone else? Just stand to your feet and say, I'm not going to make God bless you. Thank you for standing up. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Stand up for the glory of God. God bless you. I see you here on the front. God bless you. God bless you. Stand with your head held high and look to heaven and say, I see you, God. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. Anyone else? Don't listen to the enemy. He's going to try to stand on your feet. I see you standing there, sir. Anyone else? Just stand to your feet and say, you know what? No more excuses. I'm not going to let the enemy stop me from this. God bless you. I see y'all standing back there. Anyone else? Just stand to your feet right where you're at. God bless you. I'm not going to tarry. If your excuse not to stand can stand with God in eternity, 
you hold on to it. But if you know it's not going to, I ask you to stand to your feet right where you're at and seal the deal today and say, you know what? I'm going to be God's. Things are going to be different from this day forward. I'm done with making excuses. I want to ask those that sing and those that's sitting that we pray together. Those of you that are standing, I, I just want to ask you to pray in your own way to God. If you've never given your life to Him and you know He's touched your heart and drawn you by the power of His Spirit, that's why you're here today, my friend. Maybe He's drawn you back to Him today. Well, would you just pray to Him and say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for drawing me here today. Just ask and say, Lord, would you accept me as yours? I give my life to you. Would you tell them, say, Lord, I believe it's you that's touched my heart through your spirit. I believe Jesus came for me. I believe Jesus died for me. And he rose for me to set me free. Just tell him, now I confess my sins to you. I ask forgiveness of those sins that I've committed in my life. I ask you, Lord, to save me. I give my life to you. Tell him, say, Lord, I repent of the things I did. I'm going to turn from anything I was doing wrong when I leave here today. I'm going to get in a good Bible-believing church, whether it's freedom or another one. I'm going to tell somebody of what you've done in my heart today. I'm going to follow in baptism. And let my friends, my family, and everyone know that I'm different. That I'm done. But starting with you, everything is new. Thank you, Father, for what you've done today in these people's lives. They were bold and courageous to stand because they're done with the way things have been. And they're ready to bless each family and every member that's standing that's given their lives to you. May you bless them. I want to challenge every one of you that's standing to your feet. If you've given your life to Christ or you're recommitted to him, I want to ask you to come up here and see me up front. When it's over with, I'm going to be standing up here. Bring that connection card with you out of the back of the seat. We want to know who you are. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to give you one. We want to celebrate your new life in Christ. I want to meet you right down here. Would everybody else stand as we pray? Father, this is amazing what you have just done in the hearts and lives of people. God, find us all faithful. God, may we go out into a world of hurting people that are throwing in the towels and quitting and saying they're over this and they're done. And may we talk to them and say, God has a different plan. Use us for that till we come back again. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. All right. Give God glory, church. All right.